Hi, it's Robin. I was reading Your Computer, which at one stage was Britain's biggest-selling home computer magazine. In the July 1982 issue, I saw this interview on pages 38 and 39 with the main engineer of the ZX Spectrum. In the article, he explains how the VIC-20 is a second-rate computer because both the graphics and the sound are limited by the VIC-20's internal ROM software. He also talks about how the new ZX Spectrum is meant to run alongside the ZX81 rather than replace it. I gotta wonder, now if the VIC-20 is a second-rate computer, what does that make the ZX81? Oh, don't be sad, ZX81. I still love you. Anyway, eventually I let that go, and I kept flipping through that issue. And on page 16, I saw the headline, Commodore Blitz Market with VIC-10, VIC-30, and Commodore 64. What is a VIC-10, and what is a VIC-30? So I read the article, the latest Commodore microcomputers were shown in the UK for the first time at the Commodore Computer Show in London on June 3rd through 5th, this is 1982, the VIC-10 is a bottom-of-the-range games computer and music synthesizer. A 6566 video chip allows three-dimensional graphics, while a SID chip allows for three voices, each with a nine-octave range. Main features of the VIC-10 are a 40 by 25 color text screen, high resolution color graphics, 2K of RAM, and facilities for plug-in games cartridges, joysticks, paddles, and light pen. The VIC-10 does not have built-in BASIC, but a mini BASIC cartridge is available. The VIC-10 costs £100 and should be available from September 1982. So I don't remember ever hearing of a VIC-10 before, but those specifications make it sound exactly like the Commodore Max machine. And sure enough, that machine was originally known as the Ultimax, and then for a short while, at least in some markets, it was being planned to be the VIC-10, that is an even lower-end computer than the VIC-20, and then eventually got named the Commodore Max, and in the end was only released in Japan, as far as I know. Continuing on with the article, the next newcomer in the Commodore range is the VIC-30. This uses the same 6566 chip as the VIC-10, but it includes 16K of usable RAM and a 20K ROM built-in operating system. This machine is compatible with existing VIC-20 peripherals, such as the 1540 disk drive, the VIC cassette, and the 1515-1525 printers. Priced at £250, the VIC-30 is expected to go on sale in January 1983. So the VIC-30 sounds an awful lot like a Commodore 64, which also has 20K of ROM, that is an 8K basic ROM, 8K kernel ROM, although really it's about 9K basic and 7K kernel, and a 4K character ROM, which is 4K of the bitmapped fonts that make up the Petsky character set. And it mentions the 6566 chip. That's one of the variations of the VIC-2 chip. The most famous variations are the 6567 and 6569 that ended up in the Commodore 64. The 6566 is the version that ended up in the Commodore Max. So this article is saying that the VIC-30 will also have that 6566. And the big thing about that chip is that it does not support the dynamic RAM refresh that the Commodore 64 has to enable the 64K of dynamic RAM. Instead, it requires static RAM, SRAM, which is far more expensive. The Commodore Max only has 2K of static RAM, and the VIC-20 only has 5K of static RAM built in. So small enough amounts that they can keep the costs fairly low, but 16K of static RAM would be very expensive quite possibly more expensive than 64K of dynamic RAM. Okay, and again, back to the article, the Commodore 64 bears a remarkable resemblance to the VIC-30. 
The main differences are that the Commodore 64 has 64K of RAM and is capable of accepting a second processor, such as a Z80, to run CPM. In addition, the Commodore 64 memory map can be rearranged to allow the use of software written for other Commodore 40 column machines. The Commodore 64 costs 400 pounds and should be available from October 1982. So that sounds about right for the Commodore 64. It's a little odd mentioning the Z80 to run CPM, but that did eventually get released as an add-on cartridge for the Commodore 64. Now, this was being written in June of 1982. The Commodore 64 was first released in the U.S., not until August of 1982, and it took a while to get released in other parts of the world. So back to the VIC-30, that's something I've only ever heard of ever so briefly, and that was on the excellent Secret Weapons of Commodore website as one known codename for the Commodore 64 during development. But in this Your Computer article, the VIC-30 is clearly a distinct product from the Commodore 64 with a much lower price. And we shouldn't confuse it with the Commodore 16, which does share the same case as the C64 and 16K of RAM, but that wasn't released until 1984 as actually a cut-down version of the Plus 4 computer, which uses the TED chipset, which is a completely separate architecture than mentioned here in this VIC-2-based 1982 lineup. So was this just unsubstantiated rumors? Was this complete vaporware? I found more references to the VIC-30 in other magazines from the UK. So it seems for a period of maybe a few months in 1982, one or more people at Commodore UK really wanted the VIC-30 to happen. Let's take a look at them. So here's a magazine called VIC Computing. I was surprised that the UK had a dedicated VIC-20 magazine. Here in the October 1982 issue, on page 3, it mentions the Max, Ni Ultimax, and subsequently called Vicky and Vic-10, before Commodore finally settled on a name, will be around in small numbers for the Christmas trade. The recommended price for this games-oriented machine will be £110, though most retailers will probably sell the Max for $99.95 anyway. So there's confirmation that the Vic-10 did become the Max. Although in the end, the Max never was sold in the UK as far as I know. Then continuing on, next spring, there'll probably be something called the VIC-30 too. That is the VIC-30 also. A 16 kilobyte VIC with a 40 column display, a 16K version of the 64. In fact, priced midway between the VIC-20 and the 64. More of that later. And then there's a discussion of how the VIC-20 price can actually come down quite a bit. The official description now reads, the Commodore VIC-20 computer for $169.99. The VIC-20 was previously $199. Our reading of the price cut on the VIC and the pricing of the new products is that they are designed not only to keep the competition at bay, but also to prevent them from competing with each other. As speculation, that makes quite good sense. Next April could well see the Max at £100, the VIC-20 at, say, £150, the VIC-30 at around £210, and the 64 selling at about £275. This has enough difference between the prices to prevent them competing with each other. And more important, it has the VIC-20 sensibly filling a gap in the range of prices. That implies a continued role for the VIC. And then on the next page, our source at Commodore Towers say the marketing people here are pushing strongly for a VIC-30. Though we understand no decisions have yet been taken, this 16K version of a Commodore 64 could well be the way of improving the lot of the VIC-20 user. The proposal being considered is that from next April or thereabouts, VIC-20 owners would be invited to send back their machine and a check for 100 or 150 pounds, we've no idea, in order to receive a replacement. So was this source at Commodore Towers just one guy pulling everybody's leg? Or was the whole of Commodore UK into this plan? So I found even more coverage. Here in the May 1982 issue of Popular Computing Weekly, on page 5, 
there's a news headline, Vic gives specs for two. At the recent Hanover Fair, Commodore were able to announce quite detailed specifications on their new range of microcomputers, including the Ultimax, now renamed the VIC-10, and the VIC-30. The VIC-10 has an anticipated price of £100. That's consistent with what we've learned about the Max. Moving on, the VIC-30 is essentially a big brother to the other machine, having a VIC-20 style keyboard, but retaining the 40 by 25 character display on the screen. You have 16K of RAM on board and also a full basic operating system. There's a serial interface port, memory expansion port, and a cassette interface port all built in. Delivery is scheduled to commence in January of 1983, and the estimated retail price will be £250. So here's the VIC-30 also being announced in Germany. Reported in a different magazine, presumably a different reporter, and a different show, but the information is very consistent with what we've already seen. So maybe this wasn't just a Commodore UK thing. Commodore actually allowed a lot of independence to their regional groups, and they had freedom to dream up their own products and ways of marketing them. So we're starting to get an idea of a complete VIC series, where you've got the VIC-10 for £100, the VIC-20 for maybe £169, the VIC-30 initially for £250, and then the VIC-64, also known as the CBM-64, and ultimately the Commodore 64, for £400 on the high side, but that started quickly changing due to competition. But here's a bit more information in the August 1982 issue of Vic Computing, which puts some closure to this adventure. Here on page 17, it talks about the third international Commodore computer show in June in the Cunard Hotel in Hammersmith. They complain about the air conditioning not working very well, and that Commodore itself was pushing the Commodore 8000 line, that is, their higher-end PET computers, and there was even an exhibit with the top-end machine, the 2,000-pound plus Commodore 720. But where were the smaller machines? Commodore had occupied two whole pages of the show catalog with an ad for the VIC-10. One searched the show in vain for a sight of this 100-pound games computer, though, and now we hear that won't actually appear as the VIC-10. Instead, it'll be called Max. The original name was Ultimax, remember? And we might get to see it around Christmas time. Nor will there be a VIC-30. Remember the VIC-30? That's the 16K 40-column version of the VIC-20. Or at least it was. Our spies now tell us that the idea has been discreetly shelved. Instead, the next model up will be the Commodore 64, more or less a 64K version of the 40 characters per line VIC. This is another of those computers Commodore announced at Hanover. Confused? You won't be. Come Christmas time, we'd guess our stockings will be offered at the choice of Max at £100, VIC-20 at, say, £170, and the VIC-64 at around £240. Nothing else. So you can see how rapidly things are changing. And actually, really bizarrely, this is in the August 1982 issue of Vic Computing. And previously, we were reading the October issue later with less up-to-date news. But perhaps that's just lead times on articles and <laughs> articles being submitted in different order. I can't really explain that. No matter what, there's definitely confusion around this issue. And ultimately, you can tell how it all ended up being vaporware. So why did the VIC-30 never appear, crushing Commodore UK's dream of a full range of computers at several price points? Well, it mostly boils down to competition in the UK, especially from the 16K ZX Spectrum, which surprised everybody when it arrived, priced at only £125. Another case of conflicting information coming out in strange order, here in the May 13th, 1982 issue of Popular Computing Weekly, confusion over Commodore counterattack. Speculation is mounting about how Commodore will react to the launch of the ZX Spectrum. The first story we heard from a Commodore mole was that the newly announced Ultimax slash VIC-10 computer was to be abandoned 
and that the price of the new Vic 30 would be reduced to 125 pounds to match that of the Spectrum. According to this version of the internal wranglings at Commodore, the decision to abandon its long-held plans for the home computer market came after a 15-page technical report on the Sinclair Spectrum was presented to Commodore marketing manager John Baxter. The original scheduled delivery date for the VIC-30 was around September this year. Commodore's spokesman Peter Walker denies that any such decision has been taken. He says that Commodore is still considering whether to change the specifications or prices of any of its new computers. One major Commodore dealer claims that he is being assured by Commodore that the Ultimax VIC-10 will be kept alive and that the price of the VIC-30 will only be reduced to £160. If Commodore significantly reduces the price of the VIC-30, it will also need to bring forward the scheduled delivery dates to stand a chance of offering serious competition to Sinclair. The similarity between the specifications of the VIC-30 and the ZX Spectrum is striking. Sinclair, however, has the advantage of a captive market of ZX81 users, the ZX printer, and the promise of the Spectrum RS-232 link. So in the end, the VIC-10, or Commodore Max, price of £100 was too high for a 2K computer to be competitive with the 16K ZX Spectrum, so it got dropped completely in the UK. The VIC-20 price got pushed down rapidly from £200 to £170 to under £120 by early 1983, while the C64 rapidly dropped to below £300. And just one other strange thing to give an indication of how ridiculously fast things were changing there for a while and how companies, I guess especially Commodore, was struggling to keep up. Here's the June 1983 issue of Vic Computing that runs an ad stating, Vic 20 is the finest home computer that money can buy as part of a campaign for their software. This is published a whole year after most of the articles that we've looked at today. So it took Commodore another year to get their full range of VIC-20 software together. Now, by then, the VIC-20 really was a second-rate computer. Now, of course, there are price wars going on in the USA as well, with TI-99 and Atari and Commodore. But we've been specifically focusing on this little-known VIC-30 computer, which was ultimately vaporware, but had more of a story to it than I originally knew about. Hopefully you've enjoyed hearing about this little piece of odd Commodore history. Thanks to my friend Darren Folds of GruTube for his excellent work creating these artists' impression of the Vic 30. Thanks to my patrons for their support, and thank you for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Which I did.